Now, um, the way that I want to um, introduce today's workshop is to say this. Some students are good students every other time except when they take tests. And then they usually perform lower than they hope to. And for some reason, it just doesn't come from here out on the paper very well. Uh, part of the reason for that sometimes is that a person doesn't prepare well for tests. So when they go in, they're not ready. That will always cause you to score lower. The other reason is because even though they prepare well, they're not good test takers. So when the teacher gives them the test, they do lots of things that make them score low. So the next two workshops will be about the test taking. And today is about how to prepare. And I'm going to make one statement to start with, and then I'm going to give you a handout that we're going to use as an outline today. And the one statement I know is kind of a stupid statement, but I'm going to say it anyway. And that is the number one reason why people don't do well on tests is because they don't study. How's that for an easy idea? So um, if a person walks into a test and they haven't even opened their book or they haven't even studied, I can't do anything to help them because they didn't prepare. But there are other things that people do, and I know that you see all these problems up here. People look at this and they say, that's very depressing. Where are the solutions? They're coming today. But there are four problems that usually cause people not to do well on tests in terms of how they prepare. And that's what I'm going to focus on today, on three of them in particular. And then one a little bit quickly at the end. So what I'm going to give you now is an outline of the workshop. It has a place for you to write notes directly on here if you would like. Some people actually find that helpful. Other people like to write on notebook paper. Either one's okay. Okay. So <clears throat> we have Two problems on the front, two problems on the back, along with solutions. So I promised you that I wasn't going to just talk about bad things, but I was going to talk about how to help, how to improve these. So the very first problem, the one that goes in this little blank, if you want to copy that down, is a really big problem for a lot of people that they have to fix. And that's cramming, which means waiting and waiting and waiting until the very last night or even the last minute to study for a test. Um, if you have a very small quiz that covers a tiny amount of information, you might be able to be okay doing this. But if it's a test and it covers a lot of material, waiting until the last minute is almost a guarantee of getting a bad grade. And so I have two solutions to, get, to offer to you about how to fix this so that you don't get in this bad habit or if you're already in the bad habit, how to break it. And those are listed right on the page there. So the first one says to finish three days before. And I want to ask you a quick question before I show this. What do you think this means? Finish what three days before what? Yeah, it's before the test for sure, right? But it's actually not studying. It's something related to that. Anybody have an idea? That's, that's closer to what I'm going for. What we're after for this first idea is to finish reading. All of the reading that a teacher has assigned to you to get ready for a test, to finish all of that by the time you go to bed three days before the test. Now, some people have told me, I'm happy if I finish three hours before. Uh, so those are professional crammers, which we're trying to avoid. And so I want to ask you this. Uh, what's today's date? We're going to use this as an example. The ninth. Okay. So let's say that today's date, which is the ninth, uh, your teacher gives you an announcement that three weeks from now, you're going to have a big test, really big test. Three weeks from today is the 30th. And so that's the day of your test. They also tell you that you're going to need to read chapters 7 through 10 
That's four chapters. That's a lot of material to read to get ready for that test. So again, if, you, if this is your big problem, on what day are you going to do all the reading or most of it? On the... The test is on the 30th, right? The test is on the 30th. And you are a professional crammer, okay? So that's what I'm trying to get at right now. So what, when would that person do the reading? Yeah, somebody said the 30th. Shame on you. Yeah, yeah. It, it, so we say the 29th is when they finish. Uh, could they have been reading all along? Yeah. Yes, but they are a crammer, so they wait till the last minute. This is a huge amount of material. In most college textbooks, uh, chapters are 20, 30 pages, maybe even more. So let's say that there are 30 pages. That's 120 pages in a textbook you have to read and know. That's a lot. And to wait till the day before is like uh, eating a whole week's worth of food all at one time. And your body would not like that. And so the same thing goes for your brain with studying. So what this is asking you to do, this little technique, is to count back three days from the test. So um, three days before this test would be the 27th. And so the goal, and this would be, in this case, um, Sunday, the 27th, is to finish all the reading that you have to do. Okay, if you're able to do that, then that means that you have two more days, the 28th and the 29th, before the big day when you take your test. And the two things that are really helpful for you to do on these two days, both start with the letter R. So I want to see if you can figure those out. This is like Wheel of Fortune or something for a little bit. What, what is one R? What should you do the last couple days? Review. Review. And that's the one that's kind of easy. And I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. Um, anybody have an idea of the other one? Reread is a good idea. That's actually part of the review for what I'm going for now. So this doesn't, the other R doesn't have anything to do with this. That's it. Okay, rest. Uh, those are the two things that will help you do better on the test. Um, when you review during the last couple of days, it takes everything that you've already learned, all that hard work you've done, and it gets it all organized in your brain so it's ready to come out when you take the test. But what some students do, especially when it comes to a big test like a midterm or a final where they have a lot of work to do, a lot of people do this really well at the last minute and they don't do this at all. So they stay up really late and they get maybe two hours of sleep because they're studying all night and they're drinking coffee or five hour energy or whatever. They're drinking all these things trying to stay awake. But then when you go in to take the test and you start reading the questions and you start searching through your brain, when you're that tired from lack of sleep, your brain doesn't work very well. It's hard to think as clearly as you'd like. Some people do that and then other people are the opposite. I've had some students of mine who I call professional resters. They always get plenty of rest, plenty of sleep. They hardly ever do this, so that's not so good. So if you actually treat both of these as equally important, usually when you walk in to take the test, here's what happens. You have done all the reading. You've spent the last couple days reviewing. You've gotten to bed at a good hour because you're not cramming. And then when you walk in to take the test, your brain is filled with knowledge and you're alive and have energy. That's the best combination I know to do well on a test. And so again, if you have a class this semester where you have a quiz every week, this really isn't that important. This is more for when you have a test every three weeks, four weeks, six weeks, these big tests trying to avoid waiting till the very last minute to do the reading and just sort of target that day three days before. And it helps a lot. It takes a lot of stress away as well. Okay, so that's the first idea under problem number one. And then the second one says to set up a smart review schedule. Um, I'm going to do a little exercise with you that um, is going to hopefully show you a few ideas related to the subject of how to set up a good schedule to review. So I'm actually going to put you to work on something in a second here. And I want you to look at this paragraph at the top of the page. 
I'm going to go ahead and uh, kind of set it up or explain it for you and then have you make a choice. Okay, so at the top it says that this uh, woman, Susan, is going to have a very difficult two weeks. She's going to have a test in all three of her classes, history, psychology, and math. That sounds pretty tough. Okay, and she needs to figure out a review schedule that will enable her to be successful on her exams. And then it says here that she feels that the math test will be the hardest for her, history medium, and the psychology test will be probably not easy, but at least the least difficult. So what I want you to do, and I'm going to give you uh, a minute or two to look at this, is I want you to look at these three schedules on the page. When you first look at them, they look the same, but they're not. And I want you to look at them very carefully and try to pick the schedule you think would be the best for her to follow. And when you've decided, you can put a little check mark or an X like you're voting for number one or two or three. But I don't want you to do it really fast. I want you to take a little time to look at it and just see what you can notice there. Okay, I'll give you a little longer. I know sometimes it's hard to figure out, but I just want to see how well you can do. Okay, if you haven't picked one, go ahead and go for it. You have one in three chance of getting the right answer. So. Uh, we'll see how you do. Okay, so go ahead and mark something. One, two, or three. Okay, what I want to do is take a couple of minutes and go through these one at a time and point out good things, bad things about them. And so the first schedule that's considered not good, in fact, this is considered the worst one. So if you pick this, you're out already, that's okay, is schedule number one. Um, what is wrong with schedule number one? Yeah, it's just too much. Uh, this poor person will kill themselves if they try this. They actually have a total of 10 hours of studying during the day, and they're also in class three hours. So that's 13 hours. And unless you're the most unusual person ever, you're never going to be able to concentrate and get a lot done. It's just too much. So schedule two and three are considered better, but the other one that's considered not quite as good for two reasons is number three. So if you pick number two, you got the right answer. Even if you were just guessing, you can pretend like you knew. So I want to ask you, what do you notice in schedule number three that makes it not as good as schedule number two? Anybody notice? Yes. Oh, that's very good. That's the hard one that a lot of people never notice. What is this person supposed to be doing at 1 o'clock? What does it say? Yeah, they have a class, but they don't have a class on Schedule 3, and that's because they did what to me is one of the worst habits that a student could ever develop, which is to skip one class to study for another one. If you only did that one time in all of college, you would probably be okay. But most people who do it once start doing it all the time. It just becomes their habit. And um, what they think when they do this is, well, I know I should be going to that class, but I've got a test later today in this other class, and I need to study for that one. So they decide which one is most important. Um, I don't know if this will surprise you or not, but I've actually had students in my classes come up to me about five minutes before class when I'm getting ready to take roll and this is what they say. They walk right up to me and they say, hi, I just wanted to let you know I'm not going to be here today. And I said, oh, 
okay, is everything okay? You know, I'm just concerned. Did you not feel well or did you have a call from home? And here's what they say. They say, no, I'm fine. I just have a paper due in one of my classes later today and I don't have it done, so I'm going to go during your class and finish it. Well, you know, my attitude is always, you know, you're adults. You can come to class, you can not come to class. Nobody's going to call your parents or anything like that. This is, this is college. But I've had people actually tell me that and then they said, but it's okay that I missed today because I have a friend in the class and I can just get the notes from them. Well, that sounds okay, except have you ever seen other people's notes? They're scary. They may be the only human being who understands what they wrote. And so I think you know there's no substitute for actually being there and hearing the teacher yourself. So if you do that, if you skip one class to study for another one, it means that you didn't do a good job with your time management. Okay, the other thing has to do with something up in the paragraph. And I don't know if anybody spotted this, but the other reason that Schedule 3 is not quite as good is the hint is up in the paragraph. Look at this, um, this schedule, schedule number three, and look at the study hours. Okay. That's right. So if you look at schedule three, there are six hours of studying. You know, six hours of studying in one day, that's a lot. But remember, this one was 10, so six sounds a lot better than 10. But look at the way the time is broken up. It's two hours for each subject. Well, that doesn't make sense given what we read up in the paragraph that she thinks math will be a lot harder than the other two. So if you look at schedule number two, there are still six hours of studying, but it's three hours for the hardest subject down to one for the easiest one. And so it's just a smarter way to kind of budget or manage your time. Now, one last thing about this. I hope you all know this, but I want to ask anyway. When you look at Schedule 2, which is the best one, you notice that this person has scheduled to, pre, uh, to review or study math from 8 to 11 in the morning. That's three hours, right? That's what it says. So does that mean that they're supposed to sit down at 8 o'clock and then get up at 11 when they're done? No. Yeah, the answer is no. That's what it looks like there, but what are they supposed to be doing every hour? Yeah, a little break, you know, whether it's 5, 10, 15 minutes. As long as your break isn't longer than your study. If you study 10 minutes and take a 50-minute break, uh, that's bad. But you always need little breaks because your body needs that, your brain needs that, and as long as you remember to go back and study some more, then breaks are much better than just sitting there for a long, long, long time studying. So these are concepts, again, related to this solution number two. All right? So that's the first problem is trying to avoid cramming. And just by doing that, it can help your scores to go higher. But there's another problem that a lot of people struggle with. And so the way that I'll say this is the second problem is lack of knowledge. Okay, and I want to explain what I mean by that. Um, by this, I don't mean lack of knowledge of the subject area. What I mean is lack of knowledge about what the test is going to be like. And all of you, I think, have had teachers before who are very mysterious about an upcoming test. They don't give you a study guide. They don't give you any real help to know what it will be like. They just say, go and figure it out. And other teachers are very specific, and they tell you exactly what to study. Well, if you look at these three questions at the bottom of the page, these are three among several that are really good for you to know the answer to as far ahead of the test as possible. I don't mean five minutes before. I mean like a week before or two weeks before because actually knowing the answers to these questions can change the way you study and get you a better grade. So I want to explain what, this, what I mean by this. And by the way, um, the next few minutes I'm going to write a lot of numbers on the board and it's going to look like a math workshop. And if you're not a math person, don't tune me out. I want you to kind of follow anyway. Uh, don't let the numbers scare you, okay? Um, let's say that you talk to a teacher one or two weeks before a test and you ask them the first question there. How many questions will be on the test that we have? Some students, when I tell them you need to ask that, they look at me and say, what difference does it make? If you have 20 questions or 50 or 100, you still have to study, so why would that be important to know? So I'll give you this example. Let's say that you ask this teacher, teacher number one, 
uh, how many questions are on the test. And they tell you that there are 50 questions. And we'll just say that they're all Scantron type questions just to make it easy. You look in your textbook and you find out that you have to read 100 pages for that test, which is a lot. Okay, the math on this, since 50 is half of 100, means that on that particular test that we're looking at right here, the teacher will ask you an average of one question for every two pages in the book. Okay, that's what that means. Well, why is that helpful? Well, I want to compare it to this one. Let's say that you ask your teacher how many questions and they tell you it's 100 and you look in your book and that's 50 pages of reading. So it's the opposite, okay? So now it's two questions for every page. Okay, well, again, why is that significant? Yes? How do you come up with the one to two, though? Oh, since, since uh, 100 is twice as much as 50, it's like two to one, okay. you know, twice as much. Right. And so um, if you find out that the teacher is going to ask you one question for every two pages in your book. If you think about two pages of a textbook open and you look at all of that, you know how many questions a teacher could find from all of that? They could find 10 or 15 or 20 questions. So if they're only going to ask you one out of all of that, the chances are really good that what they're going to ask you is something big like a main definition or a big main point. If they wanted to ask you little questions, they would ask many, many more. So how do you study for a test like this? I think usually basically the way that you already do, which is you read everything and then you go back and try to make sure you learn the main things. But this test is very different. So instead of having one question from two pages, there are two from here and two from here. That's four questions instead of one. What is this teacher going to ask you a lot more of on the test? If there, if there are a lot of questions from a small amount of material, instead of main ideas and big things, what are they going to ask? Details. Picky little details, okay? So here's what I'm trying to show you about this. Cramming, as we just got through saying, is not a very good idea ever when you have a test. But which of these two situations would be worse to cram for? Number two. Yes, number two. Why is that? It's because when you cram a huge amount of information into your brain, like the night before a test, what usually sticks there, if you're lucky, big things. What goes in one ear and out the other and is lost forever? All the little details. And if you know ahead of time that your teacher is going to ask you a lot of questions on a small amount of reading, the first thought you should have is they're going to ask me a lot of little details. And so if I wait till the night before, I'm never going to be able to get all of it in my brain. I need to start now and really start early and learn a little at a time. And that way you keep all the details in your mind. Okay? So that's the first question. The second one is very similar in idea. Um, and I wanted to give everybody here uh, sort of a little free piece of advice. This says, how much time do I have to take the test? Okay, so that's what that, what that, that means. Um, I want to ask you this. When you're in a classroom and you're taking a test, and you're in the middle of the test or a little past the middle, and all of a sudden somebody gets up and walks up to the front and hands in the test, and then they leave. And then about one minute later, somebody else hands in the test and leave. What does that do to you? Yeah, it usually makes people really nervous because they're thinking, I thought I was doing okay, but look at that genius who just walked up and passed that in. And, and they start getting nervous and feeling like they have to rush. Well, I want to tell you uh, that from my experience as a teacher, the amount of time it takes a student to finish a test has no connection whatsoever with whether they do well or not. Um, sometimes the first people to finish a test get the best grades. Sometimes the first people to finish a test get the worst grades. Because if you don't know anything, you could take a test really fast. A, B, C, C, B, A. A, B, C, and then you hand it in and everybody thinks, wow, you're so smart and you had got the worst grade in the class. Um, same thing goes for people who are among the last students. And I just wanted to share this also just as encouragement to you. My wife, 
uh, when she was in college was a great student and she ended up graduating from college and I think her grade point average was like 3.8 or 3.9 which means she got almost all A's but she told me that when she was in college almost every time she took a test she was always one of the last three or four students left in the room at the very end you know as people were leaving and her attitude was the teacher said I have an hour I'm gonna take an hour and so she didn't worry if other people left. She just concentrated and took her time and was slow and careful and took every minute that she could get. So from now on, if you ever see students in your classes turning in the test and you're still working on it, instead of just admiring them, just look, don't say this, but look at them as they walk out the door and just think, <laughs> you rushed. I'm being smart. I'm taking all the time. And that's the total opposite of what most people think. So uh, that has nothing to do with this, but that's just sort of extra. Okay. How much time do I have to take the test? Okay. Teacher number one says, you have an hour if you need it to take this test. You find out how many questions there are, and there are 30. Okay. So just like with the last example, 60 is twice as much as 30. So that would mean that you have two minutes for every question. And again, we're just assuming this is all um, multiple choice and true false for now. Um, I don't know if you've ever timed it. You probably don't know. But if you had two minutes to answer each question, that's about as good as it's ever going to get, okay? Because it doesn't usually take people that long. So when you know that this is going to be your test, how do you study for it? Probably the normal way is fine. But how about if you have a teacher, a mean one, and they say you have 30 minutes, not one more second, and you have 60 questions to answer. Okay, that's bad, okay? So this would be, again, just like the opposite of this, would be two questions per minute, which means you only have 30 seconds for each question. So on this particular test here, how many times are you gonna be able to read each question? Yeah, probably once. How many times are you going to be able to look at each choice? Once. You can't just sit there and think, ah, oh, yes, I remember learning that. Let me think if I, no, no. This is like a slow jog. This is like sprint. You have to go fast, right? So not only do you have to know the material, you have to know it fast. And so this is kind of the point of this one is, uh, can anybody think of a little study tool that you could use to train your brain to think of things really fast. It's a really small thing that some of you have used before. That's good. This is why you study. And it's something small and it has two sides to it. This shape. Front and back. There you go. Yes, flashcards. Okay. Flashcards would be good to study for pretty much any test where you have you know, facts to learn, but it's especially good for this for one simple reason. What does the word flash mean? Fast. Yeah, flash. You know, like a flash bulb, like the old cameras, flash, flash, flash. And anybody here who has ever used flashcards to learn vocabulary, you know that if you have a word on one side and a definition on the other and you have a stack of those, the first few times you go through them and you test yourself, you're kind of slow because you don't know them that well yet, but after you've gone through them several times, pretty soon you know the answers almost as fast as you can turn the cards. So you're training yourself to know the answer right away. No stroking your chin, no thinking, no looking up or whatever, but fast. And that's what you're gonna have to do for this type of test, so that's why that's a really good uh, technique, okay? And then the last one on this side, and then we'll move uh, a little more quickly through the back side, is um, the question, that to me, I guess, is almost the most important one on here, and that's text versus lecture. Okay, and uh, quick pause here for a second. Most of you have been here before, but a few of you are new, so this sign-in sheet's gonna come around now. Name, ID number, and teacher's name if you want me to contact a teacher about extra credit. So when this gets to you, if you could just fill it out and keep it going to the back, that would be good. Okay, text versus lecture, what that means is what percent of all the points on the test come from the textbook readings and what comes from the lecture notes? Okay, that's what that means. Well, here's what happens. This is why this is so important to me as a teacher. Um, I have had students before come to me with this um, sad story. I've heard this a lot. A student comes and says, uh, I'm really kind of discouraged today. 
And I say, well, why is that? And they say, well, I just got back a test in one of my classes, and I did really badly. You know, I got a D or an F. Well, that's not happy news or anything. But I ask them, well, what happened? And what do you think teachers usually assume if a student got a really bad grade on a test? They didn't study. Yeah, they didn't study. They didn't even try. And sometimes that's why people get a bad grade. But here's the sad part. Sometimes a person can get a very bad grade and they study longer, they study harder than somebody who gets an A or a B. And that doesn't seem right because if you put a lot of effort into it, you should get a good result. Well, here's the number one reason why that happens. It has to do with this. I ask the student, um, so you studied really hard for that test? Oh, I studied for hours. And you got a D or you got an F? Yep. So I ask them the question, on that test that you just got back, how much of the test came from the textbook and how much from the lecture? And almost every time I ask somebody that question, what answer do you think they give me? Yeah, they just say, I don't know. And I say, okay, well, it's too late for that test. You know, it's over, but you're gonna have another one. Teachers are usually creatures of habit. They do things the same way. So what I'd like to have you do is take a little field trip and go talk to your teacher and ask that question. That test that we just got back, how much came from each? And oftentimes they'll come back to me and they'll say something like this. The teacher said that it was about 50-50. Okay, so about half from the book, half from the lectures. And then I ask them the big question. I said, think of all those hours you spent studying and I know it's hard to know for sure, but what percent of your time did you spend studying the textbook and what percent did you spend studying the notes? And really often they'll say something like this, well, I probably spent about 90% on the book and then I looked at my notes a couple times. And that tells me pretty much everything I need to know. Their heart was in the right place, they studied hard, but the way they studied was not even close to the way the test was. And if you know ahead of time, for example, that three-fourths of all the points on the test will come from the lecture and one-fourth from the book or the other way around, that should be very valuable information and then you try to spend that much time on each one. Most people have to spend more time on the textbook than the notes because it takes longer to read. But I'm talking about once you've read and you go back and study those things, how do you do it? And you want to try to study as much as you can like the test will be. And if you do that, usually your grade will be higher. Okay? Now, over on the back side, we have one more main topic to cover and then a really quick one. And so um, for problem number three, let me uh, grab this. Um, I'm going to actually draw something really quickly on the board that is um, the same as what you have on your paper. And uh, my favorite way of saying this for the problem is this. Too much, okay? I have never had a student in all the years that I've been teaching who said to me about a test they have coming up in one of their classes, the teacher doesn't want us to study enough. Never had anybody say that. It's always, are you kidding? How can I learn all of that material? Well, this um, example that I'm gonna give you is something that I think is always helpful for everybody to know. When you look um, at your, uh, your paper there, it talks about the forgetting curve. And you see this curve, and I'm gonna kind of draw a quick version of it here. And I wanna explain what this means and why it might be helpful. So I'm actually gonna have you label a couple of things on here. And that is, you see a dot on your line that's across from the 50? There's another dot that's across from the 40. So this one that's across from the 50, you can actually write this, which is one half hour, and then the dot that's across from the 40, you can write in one hour, okay? And then once you have that, I'll explain the, the meaning of this. This is a very famous um, curve, forgetting curve, that has to do with a lot of studies with college students. And so here's basically what this means. When you close a book after you've been reading it and you leave, or you leave a classroom after hearing a lecture, do you remember 100% of what you just read or heard? 
or half of it, or none of it, et cetera. That's what this is. And then this is the amount of time that's passed since you closed the book or since you walked out of the class. Well, what this shows, which is pretty scary, is that the average person um, ends up forgetting half of what they just read or what they just heard in class after just a half hour. So that's quick forgetting. A lot of it disappears. After one hour, they only remember 40%. So the other 60% are gone forever. And then you notice when they go down to one day and to a week, it's still kind of dropping, but very slowly. So that means that most of the forgetting happens in the first hour after you're exposed to the information. Well, this is not good for you as a student because this is like a roller coaster drop almost straight down. You don't want to forget like that. You want to be able to remember. And so there are a couple of ideas as to how you can fix this so it doesn't happen. Now, I wish I could teach you something that would help you to remember 100% of what you just heard or read and to remember 100% forever. That would be good. I don't know how to do that. I'd probably make millions of dollars if I could figure that out. But what I have to suggest is also helpful, and that's this. I want to teach you a way that you can actually have things sort of leak out of your brain like this, where you remember them a lot longer. You hold on to them, because again, that helps for school. So there are two suggestions I have. The first one is just basic with this, and that is this. Um, what I probably should have had you write up here in the beginning is that this is the truth about how the brain works without immediate review. So if at, right after you uh, finish a class or right after you, you finish reading a textbook, if you don't get up and walk away but you go back and spend a few minutes and review it, you'll always remember more. This won't happen quite as bad. Okay? But on your list, you have um, a couple of other ideas, and they are listed here as number two and three, the magic number and rewrite long list. So most of the rest of the workshop, I want to explain this, and then as I said, I'll just get to the last part quickly at the end. Um, there's a magic number that's good for you to remember. This is the result of a whole bunch of studies with college students as well, and that is this. They tried to figure out, when somebody sits down and they try to learn a bunch of definitions or other facts, how many different things can the average person learn at one time and remember them for a long time? The answer, which is the magic number, is seven. Not 10, not 20, not 50. This is another reason why cramming doesn't work. So if you sat down and you really concentrated, you could learn seven things at one sitting, at one time, and remember them really well. Well, if that's true, then there's a problem. And that is, I don't know how many of you have ever had this happen in college, but some teachers do something to help their students. That's nice. They give them a study guide a week before the test or two weeks before, so that's good. And sometimes, here's what the study guide looks like. It's a list of all the terms, the vocabulary terms that you're supposed to know for the test. So that all looks good, right? It's helpful, except sometimes, the list goes on and on and on and on the back, and it's a scary looking list. A few years ago, one of my students showed me a study guide just like this that she had gotten from one of her classes, and I looked at it, and it was the front and back, and I thought, that's the longest list I've ever seen. So I counted it so that I could tell all my students forever. Here's how many terms were on this person's study guide. 183, and the teacher handed that at the end of class and said, have a good weekend. And everybody is just standing there looking, and the, of course the reaction is, are you kidding? Nobody can learn that much. It's scary to look at. Well, when you get a really long study guide and you're just thinking, oh, I, there's no way I can learn that, you have two choices. One, go right away and drop the class. That's not the best choice. The other one is to say, how can I actually get all of that in there so that I can learn it for the test. And that's where number three on this list comes in, which is rewrite long lists. And so what you would do would be to take this scary looking long list and you would take a sheet of paper and you would write down some of these items or these terms on there. And how many would you write? 
7. And it could be 8 or 9 or 6. It doesn't have to be exactly 7, but you would actually write about 7, another piece of paper, etc., and you chop up the giant list into a bunch of little lists. Now, when you're done with that and you have this stack of lists, here's the one on top. This is your first one. This is all you can see. What is your attitude going to be toward learning this? Yeah, if you're scared by learning seven vocabulary words, college probably is not for you. Seven, you should just look and say, I could learn that right now. Just give me 10 minutes, I could learn it, right? It doesn't scare you at all. Now, do you know that there are other lists underneath? Yes, but you can't see them. That's a big deal. And you learn these, then you review them, then you take a little break for a few minutes, you come back, review them again, turn the page, learn the next list, over and over. And over time, you go back and you look and you realize, I learned pretty much all of this. But as long as you keep looking at this, you almost feel defeated before you start. If you look at these little lists, you feel, oh, I could do that. And so your whole attitude gets better or stronger, okay? And so that's the point of that. I know it requires you to use a little bit of paper, but you can always even just cut papers in half if you want to try to save some. But this really works well. It's sort of a psychological thing because if you look at something and your first thought is, I can never learn that, then guess what's going to happen? You're never going to learn it. But if you look at this and you think, I could do that, I know there are other ones, but I can do that. Then after a while, you'll look back and be surprised at how much you actually learn. Okay, so that's the concept with that. And then we have one last problem, just a couple more minutes for this one. This is a really easy one for me to explain, but this is a big problem for some people. So problem number four, I just have one word to write down. Um, this is my, I guess, favorite way to say it, and that is this. Pride. Okay, and what I mean by that is um, sometimes you're in a class that's difficult and it's kind of helpful to get some help. But some people, for example, with number one where it says get help, what I have in mind here mostly, even though it could be other things too, is um, tutoring. Um, does everybody know where the tutoring center is at this college? Yeah, it's right, well, no, it's actually, when, when you came up here and you walked up the big flight of stairs and then down the long hall and all that, when you first enter this building and you walk up to the top of the stairs, there's a room right in front of you and there are double doors right there. That's where tutors are available. If you ever tried to hire a tutor to help you through a class, like a private tutor, you would go broke really fast because they cost like 20, 30, 50 dollars an hour you know, who can pay that? But one of the benefits you have as a student, you know, with all the fees and everything that you pay, is that you are eligible to get a tutor one time, four times, every week, all semester, you know, whatever you need, and it's free. And the tutoring center doesn't have tutoring in every subject that you might take. But if you're ever in a situation where you're struggling at the beginning of the semester and you think this is going to be a hard class, it's good to run to the tutoring center and ask them if they have an appointment with a tutor, if they have one in that subject. And if they do, take advantage of it. Uh, one of the reasons I put pride here is that I've had some students who say, at this point of the semester, we're about halfway through the semester, and they say, oh, I'm taking a you know, biology class and it's killing me. And I said, yeah, biology is a hard subject. Have you gotten a tutor to maybe give you some guidance? And they say, no, I haven't. And I say, why? And sometimes they say, I didn't know I could. So now you know you can. But then here's the other thing some people say. say well, I'm embarrassed. And they say, well, why are you embarrassed? Well, because when you go ask for help, you're asking for help, which means I can't do it myself. And some people say, no, it's just embarrassing. I'll just do it by myself. And then they get bad grades, and they don't sleep at night because they're trying to study. Take advantage of it, okay? And then the other one is to form a study group. And this is one thing I want to just mention for about two minutes, and then we'll be all done. Um, when I was in college, like some of you, I didn't really like studying with other people. I enjoyed studying on my own. I felt like I could do that better. But even though I didn't really like those small groups, there were probably, I don't know, five or six times while I was in college where I was not only in a small group that studied, but I actually formed it. It was like my idea. I found other students who were serious about the class 
and we got together once a week or even maybe once right before each test. And the reason I did that, even though I don't like small groups, is because the class was hard. And I figure that everything that I don't understand in the book, somebody in our group will understand and be able to help me. Some things they don't understand, I'll be able to help them. And so again, it's like taking all our brains and putting them together. And every time I did that, every time I formed a study group, I know that my grade in the course ended up being higher than it would have if I had just sat at home trying to figure it out by myself. And again, it requires a little bit of lack of pride to say, I can't really do it on my own, I need help from some other people, just like with tutoring. But you might as well put your pride away and just get the help that you need, because again, you want to get good grades. Okay, so um, let me take a quick look at this. Again, I always want to make sure I can read the uh, instructor's name. Okay, this is good. I'll email all your teachers later. Um, Next week, again, we have the, su the subject of test-taking skills, and I'm going to talk about general ideas and then about true-false and matching and a few other things. So uh, hope to see you then. Um, thanks for coming today.